I do want to mention one thing. All the opinions expressed in this podcast are our own and do not reflect the opinions of the organizations for which we work or the recovery community at large. No, not even close. Yeah, I, I would I would actually save that and uh, play that at the beginning. I like that. All right. I like well, that. That works for me. Hey, this is Richard Zombeck, and you're listening to Buds with Suds. I just want to remind everybody that you can hear us on iTunes, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and Stitcher. If you're on iTunes, please don't forget to rate us. Uh, in fact, don't forget to rate us anywhere, but iTunes really helps us out. You can also call us at 978 978- 219-9554. Leave a message and uh, we will play it on one of our upcoming podcasts. If you have a question, comment, suggestion, that would be great. Once again, that number is 978-219-9554. So in this episode, I talked to Jared Owen, who is the Director of Public Policy for MORE, That's the Massachusetts Organization for Addiction Recovery, and they just recently had their 16th annual public policy forum. It was held at the Huvos Auditorium at Faulkner Hospital in Jamaica Plain. So Jared and I sit down, talk a little bit about that, talk about some of the legislation that's coming up, some of the public policy that different organizations are doing. So on that note, here's the conversation. You and I met, uh, I think, at an event at North Shore Community College. That's when we first met. That was, what, about a year ago? It yeah, recovery a, coaching re- forum. Recovery coaching forum. And then um, we've gone back and forth on email. I've, I've, I've been asking you to, to come on and um, talk about more and the other stuff. And then, as luck would happen, you did a public policy forum, which I think was, what, the, the 16th one? Yeah, it's been going on longer than I've been around with more, so. Okay, and we saw each other there. You were actually not the what's the word for it? The MC yep. for that. And at that policy forum were were organizations like uh, Step Rocks, Divine Recovery Center, Phoenix Gym was there. Is it Phoenix Gym or Phoenix? It's just the Phoenix. The, the Phoenix. Like you are the Richard. <laughs> okay, this is going to be a good one. Um, Safe and Sound Recovery Center, and also uh, a couple of representatives from BSAS and Partners. BSAS being the Bureau of Substance and uh, Substance Ad- of Substance Addiction Services, they changed right. their name, right? Recently, uh, Jim Jim Kramer was there, and he was the director. And Julia o- Ojeda, I always get her last name right. Is that wrong? That's Is correct. That- yeah, okay. just don't call her Julia. Right, Julia Julia Ojeda. So, uh, you come from a pretty, just for the for the lack of of a better term, I'll say a pretty jaded past. And, um, <laughs> and have been around the block like most of us that are working in this field. So why don't, why don't we start there and maybe you can, you can tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. I'm happy to share about, about my experience and my recovery a little bit. Um, you know, I won't get in, in depth with the early part, but I found alcohol at a very young age, um, like most of us. And I love the way it, it made me feel. And I, I was also really always very driven to succeed academically. My, my dad's a veterinarian and my family put a strong emphasis on education. So I did well. I graduated from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill with honors in, in 2007. And at that point, I was, uh, I was an everyday drinker. And I was I was dabbling with with other drugs, but my addiction didn't really get out of control until I was in grad school up here at MIT. Um, I started a PhD program in biology, course seven, um, and that's when the social isolation and the pressure of school really drove me um, further and further into the addiction. So I found um, I found pills in the form of opioids and uh, prescription stimulants, which I used to help me work, and. Uh, like many people, escalated pretty quickly to um, the powders and heroin and methamphetamine, namely, and really spiraled out of control. And in the, in the course of six months, went into what they call chaotic use. And that that was Cambridge too, so that wasn't that hard to find, was it? I mean, a lot of the drugs and stuff. It was around on the streets, but this was also the the time when the uh, the the dark net drug markets first emerged. So oh. we remember the Silk Road, and yeah, yeah, and yeah. that that really helped to catalyze my my downfall because it was essentially the Amazon.com of hard drugs, and I could get whatever I wanted through the mail. 
And uh, I did, and I, I lost control, and I started to commit crimes to get drugs, um, including a, an armed robbery of a pharmacy, which I, I, you know, thankfully got caught relatively quickly. And uh, it, it wasn't the prettiest place to start a recovery journey, but I found myself detoxing in the basement of the Cambridge Police Station, um, having been, you know, thrown out of school. I got a letter very quickly. And uh, facing some Class A felony charges, which I, I never imagined would happen to me in my life. So I spent a total of about 18 months incarcerated, uh, some time in some state psych wards, um, some time in a house of corrections, didn't really receive uh, any addiction treatment to speak of. But I was very fortunate. So this was the first time I had ever been in trouble. I had my, my family behind me. And I was released to a treatment facility that saved my life after those 18 months called the Meridian House in East Boston. Um, you know, jail was a little bit different than I thought it was going to be having watched shows like Oz and, and seen the news <laughs> reports. I, it, it turns out I, I wasn't in there with a bunch of you know, vicious sociopaths and gang members. It was mostly people that were, were sick and desperate like I was at that time. And the statistics really bear that out. You know, Middlesex House of Corrections, the sheriff has said, is 85% people with addictions and or mental health problems. So, Really? 85%? Absolutely. absolutely. That's staggering. Absolutely. And uh, like I said, I was, I was really lucky, and I, I left behind a lot of brothers in there that, that weren't so lucky, and they end up serving long sentences and losing big chunks of their lives and also being released back out onto the street without the help and support that they need to recover. And that, that's tantamount to a death sentence with the, the ongoing epidemic. So you probably heard the statistic from the governor's report, people um, being released from incarceration are 120 times more likely to overdose and die than someone in the general population. What do you, what do you think, what do you attribute that to? I think there's a few things. I think that um, one is that obviously you're you're pulling people from an already concentrated group that that has a lot of people with addiction problems in it. So most of the people that are incarcerated are there because they have addiction problems, so they're more likely to overdose. But you also have the element of people being locked up and um, losing their tolerance to the drugs, getting out using the same amount that they did before and overdosing and dying. We've also had this issue that, that I experienced a loss to last year where people are being taken off the, the medications that, that they're taking for their addiction while they're incarcerated and then they're released without a prescription and um, you know sometimes still sick from the, the withdrawal from those medications and, and overdosing because they go out and they choose the alternative. Um, so that that's some of what has has really driven my passion and advocacy to try to change this often broken system that I saw from the inside. So when when exactly? So you you got out. Um, I mean, you you were incarcerated. How how long ago was that? I was released in February of 2015. Okay, and then um, the university threw you out for the theft or for the drug use? Uh, for the the pending legal charges. Okay. Um, and I mean, I can say that it's, it usually comes later in my story, but in, in 2017, I was able to go back to MIT and through a, a disciplinary process, they assigned me to work on an outreach project about addiction on campus. And I did a presentation with a, with an, es, with, with an excellent professor over there named Seth Nukin, who's also in recovery from heroin. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave me my master's degree based on the work that I had done before. Oh, that's um, the oh whole wow. That's down. really so, good. Yeah. It, it, it really showed that they they stepped up, and for a university that always hasn't always had the best reputation around student mental health, they they did. No, well I, I actually had a friend of mine in high school that jumped off the tower, yeah, uh, based on the pressure. And I don't even think that he was he was using any kind of pharmaceuticals at the time. I think it was just the pressure of of the the curriculum itself. And your your master's in, is it is also in biology, or that's correct. Okay, interesting. So going back to what you had said earlier about the the incarceration and the the help getting out so you you got out of jail and and then what happened so i got out of jail in in as i said february of, of 2015 with a gps ankle bracelet and my parents drove me to the Meridian House in, in East Boston. And I've, I've, I'm still very close to my counselor there, Deb David, who's an incredible woman. And she describes my arrival there as, as seeing a very broken person, that I couldn't look anybody in the eye. I couldn't really conduct a conversation because I had just been kind of beaten down by this system. And, and I didn't know when I was going to get out. And then I, I didn't know if I was going to have to go back. And the, that's when the recovery community in this treatment facility really saved my life, where they showed me um, the unconditional love 
involved in support and they, they taught me about recovery enough that I could rebuild myself and find a path. So um, I was able to spend a full year there, but I went back in front of that judge in December of 2015. And because I had started to, to talk about my addiction publicly and because I had all this support behind me, I was given five years of probation. The, uh, the state's attorney was asking for five to seven years in state prison. Wow. And, and then what? And then what? I was also <laughs> I was also lucky enough to get a stipulation that um, that whenever I spoke at a school or college about my addiction, I would get two weeks off the end of that probation. So that's um, that's something I did quite a bit. And a recent development is of um, in January, I went back in front of the same judge from earlier, and they terminated my probation three years early based on the work that I had done. So, so there, so there's hope. The legal system really worked for me, but if I had not had the privilege and and the kind of resources to draw on that I had, um, I could very well still be incarcerated to this day. And that's that's just the reality. Money does to make a difference. Um, where you come from does make a difference in our system, and that's just not fair. You know, I, I started volunteering for this wonderful organization called MORE while I was still in the Meridian House. I, I dedicated a, a day a week um, to MORE after I graduated from that house. And eventually they, uh, they, they signed me on and, and they started paying me to do this work, which I'm, I'm very pleased and fortunate to be able to do. So, so talk a little bit about MORE, the history, what it, what it does. To be honest with you, I've been doing this. I've been in this field for almost three years. And um, it's my own fault. But, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons I'm happy to have you here is to explain to me what the hell this sure. organization is about. So I'd say, I mean, at, at the most basic term, more is part of the recovery movement. So back in 1991, um, insurance companies started to really slash coverage for addiction treatment. The 28-day detox was disappearing. And my boss, Marianne Frangoulis, who is a woman in recovery and was an addiction counselor at that time, stood up and said, wait this isn't going to work. People need help. And she started to form this grassroots um, organization called MORE, which eventually became a 501c3 nonprofit with the mission to organize recovering individuals, families, and friends into a collective voice to educate the public about the value of recovery from addictions. What does that mean? Um, we do the education part. So we have classes for people early in recovery to help them overcome obstacles like employment, like dealing with a criminal record, like having healthy relationships. We also have some recovery coaches on staff who work through the Access to Recovery program and through a, the, uh, the Optum Healthcare for people with Harvard Pilgrim Health Insurance to get recovery coaches. And we do educational classes for the public. So, we, so you, you guys have been doing the recovery coaching for, for a few years now, right? Correct. How, how, long, how far back does that go? Uh, I'm, I don't know the exact number, but I think about seven. So for the for the last seven years, you've had recovery coaches, which I which I think is probably one of the one of the oldest organizations in the state, at least, right? To have right. to have recovery recovery coaches on board, right? And you've been working there since. I've been there um, for almost three years now. Okay, so you started in two thousand sixteen. Two thousand sixteen. Yeah. And and do you know do you know how many how many recovery coaches they've employed or so we have five part time recovery coaches on staff and we have one full time recovery coach and education supervisor. Okay, so you've got that component, and then there's also there's kind of a, a lobbying arm to more too, right. isn't there? So we we don't say lobbying. Uh, we uh, we we do policymaker education, which is a little different than lobbying. We're not we're not. Um, we're not being influenced by any kind of outside groups besides the recovery community. Okay, so so yeah. so, so let's let's back up on that because I do I do want to I and I'm not gonna I'm not trying to be adversarial. I'm not going to get into an argument with you about it. But it it is in a, to a degree lobbying in as much as that's what lobbying was supposed to be, right? I went to lobby for financial reform with Elizabeth Warren's group and the Americans for Fairness in Lending and AFL CIO. Uh, back in 2011, 2012, we went to Washington, D.C. to lobby the congressman for for some kind of financial reform, right? right. And I can understand why you don't use the term, um, but it, it is, yeah. in, fa it is in mean, fact, to a degree, lobbying, right? It's like... it's Yeah, it's been turned into kind of a dirty word of by, course it yeah, has. by, of course <laughs> by it has. the actions of yeah. some individuals. Be because, but, because you have you have Purdue Pharma that are right. also lobbyists, yeah. and, you know, and, th uh, this is what happens. You know, our, our mission is really to bring the voice of the recovery community to the policymakers to make um, 
the system better to make sure that there's better prevention, treatment, and recovery support services. So um, that takes the form of getting out there and having regional meetings in the policy forum like you went to, informing the public, getting feedback, and then going up there and meeting with legislators. And we have some great legislative allies. We also have a lot of legislators that don't understand the issue. So we need to get up there and we need to talk and share our stories like, because like, that's what makes a difference. Like what, for example, when you say they don't understand the issues? Uh, I... I one time had to explain the difference between um, an opioid and a stimulant to a state rep who was running for district attorney of Suffolk County. <laughs> How'd that go? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, sometimes people just come from different backgrounds and in, in different worlds, and we don't realize um, we don't realize the lack of education around addiction that the general public gets, and even the medical profession gets. Um, so I go in, in front of groups that are, are training to, to work with DCF and it, it blows their mind that people can't find long-term addiction treatment beds. They think, of course, people should be able to do that. They're sick, but they don't realize how, how the system works and how different it is from the medical treatment system that they're familiar with. How, how it, can you explain that a little bit? So... I think that the general public who hasn't had family members go through the criminal justice and addiction treatment system thinks that we have a better developed system than we do have. So, um, you know, in Massachusetts, we have nearly universal health care. If, um, if you had a heart at, attack... I think we're at 99%, aren't yeah, we? Yeah. yeah. If you had a heart attack and you went to a, any emergency room in Massachusetts, um, you wouldn't be discharged three hours later with a list of places you could possibly go get treatment. No, you would. Yeah, you would receive, <laughs> you know, intensive care and, and follow up for for months, and you would get all the the treatment that you needed to get well. That's not necessarily the case for someone you who shows you up. You mean people would actually care? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, and that's not always the case for someone who um, has a nearly fatal overdose, and that, that needs to change. I thought what was interesting, and I, I, it was uh, the last episode, episode eight, with uh, Gary Langus, we talked about this. Uh, Gary Langus does harm reduction. I don't right. know if you know him. Yeah, um, I know Gary. He's okay. great. Okay. One of the statistics that came down from Vancouver was that, but that in, the, in their polling and in some of their discussions around uh, outreach, 91% of people who are in an active addiction are interested in some kind of recovery. Absolutely. 91%. How many 40-year-old guys do you go up to and say, listen, if you don't check your cholesterol, you're gonna, you've got a 50% chance of having a heart attack. What percentage of those 40-year-olds actually do something about right, it? exactly. Right? And here we have a situation which is riddled with stigma, and it should be like shooting fish in a barrel. Absolutely. And I'm glad you, you finally gave me a statistic to back up an anecdote that I'm always saying is that if you go down there on Mass Ave in Boston and you, you ask those people stemming for change if they want to be addicted, if they want help, the answer is going to be they don't want to be addicted and they do want help. This is, it's beyond a choice then. Um, and I think that the public just still doesn't get that concept. And they, they don't see the progressive nature of the disease that this can happen to, to anyone who has the proper um, you know, genetics and environment and it can, um, it can devastate lives. So no one wakes up as a happy functioning adult one morning and says, hey, I think I'm going to go shoot heroin today. Right. That's just not how it works. And people don't see that. Um, fortunately, and it's part of a very bad situation, but because this opioid epidemic is so widespread, the public and policymakers are, are starting to understand more and more. And that's how we're getting these changes made. So let's, let's talk uh, about uh, some of the uh, legislative priorities that you guys have. You've got... Um, in your, in your pamphlet that you, you know what I'd like to ask you too, is that uh, I'm assuming that you have all of this, the pamphlet and everything in an electronic format where I could post this on, the, on the site. We could post it under the show. Absolutely. Um, like the packet that you guys were sending out and stuff and just uh, stick a PDF up there and any other information you want to add as far as contacting legislators and, and things like that. So um, you've got what? Um, one, two, three four or five different bills here, right? That you guys are, that you guys are working on. So um, that's, that's, we're kind of still gelling together our policy priorities right now. And that's part of what the policy forum is about, but there are um, several bills in that packet that you have. And there's also some criminal justice reform um, bills and some budget items where we're interested in working on this year. So 
Just a little bit of background. Last year was a very good year for changing addiction policy in Massachusetts. Um, we got um, all three of our budget um, requests approved, which was for five more peer recovery centers. Yeah, I do. I want to talk about that, but let's 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 stick with the bills for right now. Sure. But, but yeah, that was on my list was to talk to you about the recovery centers, or we can talk about that. It's really whatever you're comfortable with. You're you're the guest after no. all. So. Um, so we got yeah, we had that victory in the budget realm. We had the victory in a comprehensive criminal justice reform package that did things like lower quarry ceiling times, and we also had the the Governor's Care Act, which there's some debate about, but it created some commissions. Um, um, that include people with lived experience to, to inform the state on recovery coaching, on medication-assisted treatment, on Section 35, and all of these things. So that's a big year for getting stuff done, but there's always more to do. So I can talk about a couple of bills now that, that I'm really excited about. Um, the first one is called an act relative to treatment, not imprisonment. And this came out of a, a Supreme Judicial Court case last year that actually got a lot of press. Um, my friend, attorney Lisa Newman-Polk, right. um, she litigated this case where her client um, named Julie Eldred had been released on probation that the stipulation that she had to remain drug free and she had to go to treatment. Um, she went to treatment. Unfortunately, she relapsed. Um, she sought further treatment, but in the meantime, she had gotten drug tested and, and fentanyl showed up and she was incarcerated. So she was taken out of treatment and, and locked up. And Lisa said, hey, this isn't right. And she appealed it the whole way to the Supreme Judicial so, Court. Look, look, I want to I want to back up just a little bit because sure. I, I don't think that. I, I understand what you're saying, but the the so she got she got arrested on a drug charge. She got arrested on a theft charge originally. Okay, so she got arrested on a theft charge, and then where did the you have to go to treatment part come in? She had been locked up, you know, after her initial arrest, and then she was released on probation with those stipulations. Um, so I don't know the exact time frame on it, but she was uh, still pretrial through this. Okay, so she she was she was arrested. She was sent to jail. She came out on probation, and part of her probation was that she couldn't use. Correct. What and why was that part of her probation? Did she have a history or? I I can't speak to her history, but it was very clear that the uh, the theft was drug motivated. It was from a family member, and I think that she was open with the court that she had addiction issues. Okay, all right, right. and then so so then so then the court is part of her probation. And punitive measures uh, stipulated that she couldn't use. Correct. Um, unfortunately, and, and you know, I, I don't need to tell this to you or any of the listeners. Uh, the nature of addiction and the definition of addiction, in part, is someone will use a substance despite negative consequences. Right. So the court basically told her when they released her, she couldn't manifest a symptom of the chronic brain disorder which she had been diagnosed of. The Supreme Judicial Court didn't see it that way, unfortunately. Um, so we we went to the legislator, le legislature. So Lisa and working with the groups like the ACLU and and the Graken Center um, made a bill that would that would prevent the courts from doing this. So basically, this bill would say that the courts can absolutely stipulate people to treatment and tell them they have to go to treatment. But if someone experiences a relapse while they're engaged in treatment, they cannot be incarcerated for that. Right, which which is interesting because even in in a clinical setting, right, where people come voluntarily, right, right. and you go to an IOP or a PHP, um, IOP for those of you listening is um, intensive outpatient, and PHP is partial partial hospitalization program, I think. Yeah. Um, well, I, I stop on these because I actually got an email from a listener who said yeah. he's new to this and he's studying at North Shore Community College. And if we, <laughs> if we could stop with the acronym so he doesn't have to pause and look everything up every time, he'd be really happy about that. It's a that. fair point. So, uh, you know, dude, if you're listening, I'm doing this for you. Um, and what's interesting is that you have, you have all these in a, in a clinical setting and you have people who presumably understand how addiction works and how, and how the disease of addiction works. But if you admit to having used while you're in an IOP or a PHP, a lot of a lot of clinical organizations will throw you out of that very same program that's there to help you, which I, f I find ludicrous. I run a group that's attended by six to 12 people once a week, right, all e in different varieties of recovery or variations of recovery. Some are still active. I don't ask anyone that comes to my group to not. Right. 
be drinking or using. I asked them not to show up completely tanked. I asked them to not show up drunk here or nodding out, but that's the only rule I have. Right. If they use during the week, I don't tell them they can't come back to the group. Absolutely. Right. Um, you know, you wouldn't tell someone not to show up for their, their diabetes treatment just because they'd eaten some chocolate cake. Um, and that's, that's getting at the, the real heart of this bill. And, and what we're trying to do here is to say that, you know, everybody likes to, to talk about this chronic brain disorder and we accept that addiction is a disease, but are we really putting our money where our mouth is? Are we really treating this like the, uh, the chronic brain disorder that it is? So I saw people while I was in treatment at the Meridian House, I saw women um, go out and use knowing that, that if and when they were caught, they, their children would be taken away. I saw men um, go out and relapse knowing that um, when they got caught, they'd go to state prison for years. And it's just the nature of addiction that we will use despite knowing those negative consequences can come our way. So um, what happens when somebody does relapse and they're, they're on a court stipulation like this? I saw that happen too. Um, one thing is they're dishonest about their relapse with their providers because they know their providers will have to notify the court, which kind of hurts the, the whole... Um, fidelity of the treatment if you can't be honest about about the symptoms you're experiencing we also or i also saw people who relapse well on a court stipulation like this and just cut and run you know give me the scissors i'm cutting off the gps bracelet and i'm going to go use until they catch me right. when um if that's that person knew they could get more treatment they probably would have taken that option so let's change this and uh you know, I have heard a little bit of opposition from this from a, a judge with the Mass Bar Association, but the way the judge explained it was that she she doesn't want to send people to jail for relapse. She just feels like she doesn't have enough options. So, she, in in other words, there aren't enough beds to send people to, and she thinks sometimes jail is the only way to keep somebody safe. Um, our counter to that is that sometimes you need to make this legislation. Um, before the, the services come. So you need to stipulate something in the law and then the providers and, and the, the state, the other people in the state government will have to step up to fund and make that, that treatment available. So what do you, what do you say to people that um, particularly judges, because I mean, my, my question is really is sometimes you need to create laws in order to counteract the personal opinion of a judge. Correct. Right. So I'm sure there are judges out there that if someone did relapse or used again, may overlook it. Right. Because it's not really a law that they have. Or is it? Is it? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say some judges. I'd say most judges would be very reluctant to send that person to jail just because of the relapse. But not all the judges have been educated or, or have the understanding that that we have. And it's in the. It's in the drug court best practices that incarceration because of relapse during early recovery should be in a last resort. And if it does have to happen, it should happen only for a few days. So all the evidence is behind that locking somebody up for um, a relapse can actually make things worse. And, and how, how so? So you, you've interrupted the recovery process. You've, you've taken that person out of treatment, if that person has some pro-social stuff going on, like employment, like a home group, like they're working on the recovery, you, you've yanked them out of that and you've put them in this correctional setting and uh, told them basically, you know, because you have this addiction, you're now a criminal. And uh, they get out without the things that they had before. Okay. So you're, you're basically taking them out of what – this is, this is kind of what I find interesting is because be, – because of what you just said, right? You have this this seemingly, and I'm not saying that in any kind of sense other than seemingly, right? That I have all I have all of my supports. I've got my friends around me who are supporting me. I've got a group, like you said, a home group, right? I'm doing all that. I screwed up one day, right? And then the court saying, "Well, we need to take you out of your environment right. because your environment's bad for you, and now we're going to throw you in jail." Right. Right. And then you go to jail for however period of time that is, uh, even a month, right? Right, And you get out and where's your support, right? Yeah. You, 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 personally, I would maybe go back to my home group with my tail between my legs, but I also might just avoid that and go, you know, Jesus, what, you know? Yeah. So 
what, which, which bill is that that you're referring to now? So that is, uh, the name is an act relative to treatment, not imprisonment. And the bill number is S-937 in the state legislature. Okay. And I think we also want to, um, when are these coming up? Because that's another important thing. I want to I be able to do for the, the people who are listening um, a call to action uh, to be able to call your legislator and let them know that you're behind these bills. So what, I, what I'm going to do is under the show on the website, and it'll, it'll be at, um, at budswoodsuds.com, and it'll be right under this episode. I'll have links and, um, and uh, files that you can download that'll, that'll give you the wording of this bill. And also, I think uh, Mary Ann at the Public Policy Forum had mentioned a website where you can find your local legislator. Do you have that off the top of your head by any chance? Or Yeah, um... It's, you can go to where do I vote ma.com and the best way to do the calls of action and to know when the key points to contact your legislators are for these bills is to sign up as a member of more for free. So it's um, our website is moar recovery.org. If you click on the join button and join at the volunteer level, you'll get notifications coming from me and some streamlined tools that help you send messages to your representatives and senators when these bills are coming up. And we also let you know when the hearings are going to happen. So one thing you can do is come to the hearings. They're open to the public and provide testimony about your experience or your family's experience. And that can be very impactful on whether a bill ends up getting put up for a vote or um, ends up being being put away. So we always encourage encourage people with with lived experience to get out there and if a state legislator hears from just five constituents out about a particular bill or issue it it comes up for them it becomes a big deal for them so you can have a voice in this stuff and i've learned that since working for more so a, a couple little pieces of advice too if anyone wants to get involved in this kind of stuff too and i learned this by dealing with legislators at the federal level um, i'm not sure if it works uh, the same way but when you, you have to contact your legislator right. because they, they will ignore anything else. Emails, they will also ignore. Um, letters, sometimes not, but letters get filtered out by zip code and end up not sometimes. Right. The best thing to do in any and all circumstances, whether it's state government or federal government, is a phone call. It's calling and getting directly to that office and letting them know how you feel. And like Jared said also, is to show up uh, at these sessions and have your voice heard, right? Or come on the podcast and talk about <laughs> it like you're doing now. Well, you know what was interesting is we did a, a show about the listening session that, that Charlie Baker had, and a couple people from that commission called us and reached out to us and let us oh. know that they really liked hearing you know, the other side here. So as much as we think having our voices heard is unimportant and people aren't listening and our vote doesn't count and it doesn't matter... Uh, I want to tell you right now, not you, Jared, but to the people listening, it matters. They listen. And I was at this public policy forum, and I spoke to a couple of the um, the senators and representatives that had come out that night to talk about some of these bills and was undeniably impressed about how um, how interested they actually were and how, how well-meaning they seem, uh, that it wasn't just glad-handing and, and – that they, they really have some oomph behind what they're saying. So, um, so this, this was a bill that uh, – now, did this come about because of Lisa's case or – Yeah, Lisa is, is really the, the big driving force behind this whole thing. And she got a group of us together, including more in the ACLU and the Association for Behavioral Health, to, to write this and to make it happen with uh, Senator Friedman's office. So it's been put in by Senator Friedman in the Senate and by Rep. Balzer in the House. And I have to say we got uh, 48 House co-sponsors and uh, I think it's up to 18 Senate co-sponsors. And that was another example of, of making our voices heard. We did, a, we did a call to action and I found out that just because of the messages that people sent through... Uh, uh, Moore's campaign, at least three uh, representatives signed on to that. And those are the ones I heard about. So there's likely many more. And uh, yeah, get out there, make sure your voices is heard. This is one bill of many. And I can talk briefly about several others if you're interested. Yeah, I just I want to um, if I've if I've got the right one, right? I, I just want to what it says on here. I'm just going to read this that this bill will uh, call in. So there are four points, and I'm just going to go through them briefly. Um, enhance public safety by enabling defendants to authentically engage in, in treatment 
and communicate honestly with their provider about relapse, exactly what you were talking about, uh, Jared, without fear that they will be locked up as a result. Uh, number two is prevent courts from disrupting the treatment process. Three is decrease incarceration rates serving uh, Massachusetts taxpayer dollars and save lives by helping people exit the dangerous cycle of relapse and incarceration and instead find sustained recovery. So can you talk about that just a little bit? The, the instead, Is there anything in the bill that has a provision for um, finding sustained recovery? So aside from just not reincarcerating if they relapse, is there any provision in the bill or any kind of program that's associated with it that's going to help that happen? I mean, what, I, what I'd really like to see is people who are at risk of relapsing and possibly being incarcerated. Uh, it's, it's, it's along the same lines of like medically assisted treatment, right? You can go in and, and, and deal with all the, the, the miracles of modern science and chemistry, but if you're not getting the correct supports or the adequate support around that, right, what, what good is it, right? So is, is there any kind of um, idea or, or plan for, for this being more kind of integrated with some kind of social network or something? So I don't think that this, this legislation can – address that. I think it helps create the need for that. In other words, the courts are going to be saying, I can't lock this person up. I need some place to, to send them. And that comes down to the court, that comes down to the state government and to the providers to create these programs. Um, in the end, we do still have this deficit and this need for beds and need for recovery supports. This is one incremental step in creating a system that supports that and that really treats addiction as a chronic brain disorder. So we'd love to come in with something sweeping that says the state has to create programs and supports for these people, but uh, it has to be done step by step. And I, I learned this when I, when I started with more, and it can be incredibly frustrating, especially when you're losing friends and acquaintances that you care about to overdose because these services aren't available, but we're, we're turning a big ship here and it takes time, unfortunately. So what, what this particular bill says, and I'm going to repeat the numbers again, the S, the SD bill, um, which is a Senate Senate bill is, uh, uh, 1477. So that's the docket number. They, they have actually updated that to a, a real number, which is S S nine, three, seven, S nine, three, seven. Right. Okay. And how about the docket number for the house? I don't have that, but S nine, okay. three, seven is S nine, three, seven is, is the, is the Senate. If I'm not mistaken, things in state government work the opposite as they do in federal government, right? Goes through the Senate first and then the house. Uh, yeah, it depends on who introduced it, but yeah, okay. it has to go through both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so in in a in a very kind of um, simplified conversation about this, this is basically saying that the courts, when they have certain stipulations on people, they need to stop viewing addiction and alcoholism, but we'll talk about it all as addiction, um, as a moral issue, and actually pay attention to the science that's been that's been played out over the last, I don't know, 50 some odd years, right? Right. It's like, let's actually start believing in what the science is telling us and, and, and address and address laws that are, that are actually going to, to pay attention to that instead of what we think addiction is about. Absolutely. And it's right here at the top of the sheet. And this was our tagline, aligning propation orders with addiction science. Yeah. Terrific. So yeah. Right. Wow. Well, maybe we can address climate science. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you said you had another bill you wanted to to um, to talk about here that was of personal interest to you. So so yeah, I I have something that's of personal interest, and it it all comes around to this this issue of having a access to multiple pathways and a continuous um, a continuous <laughs> a continuum of care. I should say that people can get the treatment that they want when they want it, have it paid for, and have the supports that can keep them in recovery for long term. So one of the bills that, that we're interested in um, is something that Senator Keenan filed. It's S-1150, and it's called an act providing uh, access to a full spectrum of addiction treatment services. Um, sounds like a lot. It's really simple. It's, it's mandating private insurance companies to cover up to 30 days of inpatient addiction treatment. 
a couple years ago, we fought to get it to 14 days. So if you go into detox and you're deemed medically necessary to receive um, treatment, um, the insurance will cover it up to 14 days. Um, we all know that 14 days is enough. This would bump it up to 30 days. And for reference, Mass Health is now covering 90 days and even more. Are they really? Right. Is that 90 days a year or 90 days at a stretch? So it's actually more complicated than that. This was done under the Medicaid waiver program that started two years ago. But MassHealth is now covering the clinical services for people in long-term treatment. And it can even be re-upped after the 90 days. So, so you're, you're saying that, that MassHealth, <laughs> a.k.a. Romney Care, right. <laughs> will, um, will cover um, detox, CSS, um, then the IOPs afterwards, potentially therapy, and all of that for, for a 90-day period and can also be renegotiated yeah. later or re-upped. Exactly. And even if you're in a, a residential treatment program like the Meridian House where I was, they'll cover the clinical services. So everything except room and board, basically. So room and board is still covered by the Department of Public Health. And this has been um, a huge move in our state that's going to do a lot of good. So this was done with a special waiver that allows us to spend Medicaid money differently than it was originally specified. And uh, we chose to use part of it towards this. Um, what does it mean as far as funding? It means that for every dollar the state f spends on um, addiction treatment through Mass Health, we get a dollar from the federal government. With this influx of money is where we're getting more beds. Wow. I had no idea that it, that it was covering. So even a, even a residential, like a long-term residential program, they'll, they'll cover the, the, clin the clinical part of it. And then the rest, your room and board and stuff like that, is is out of pocket or, or whatever. Yeah, it used to it used to all be the state through DPH, BSAS, um, Department of Public Health Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, and now Mass Health has stepped in, and that 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 extra federal funding that comes in is being put in a trust fund, and they've already put out the. Um, the RFP, the request for proposals for new programs based on that money. These programs, that the first round is for programs that will address people with uh, co-occurring disorders. So, is, is that relatively new? The ninety days. It is, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. so it's not like I missed something that's been going on for the last three years. No, and it's been rolling out slowly. Just as Mass Health started covering uh, recovery coaching services last July, um, this kicked in a little bit before, and different providers have been at different levels of of catching up with the the new billing and everything that goes on. So I can definitely send you some more information about that too. That's absolutely yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, I mean, what what I find what I find interesting is that Massachusetts. I don't know about the other states, but um, Massachusetts, I, I think, ranks is one of the top eight states with the highest levels of, of illicit drug use, right. right? At least, what is it, for ages, adults, uh, ages 26 and something, 26 and older, right? Right. Um, it, it was funny because uh, Chris, Chris Alba, who's at Healthy Streets, said, um, we're, in a, we're an intoxicated species. That's what, <laughs> that's what, that's what he said on the, on the, la the last show I, I had him on. And I thought that, I thought that was an interesting Every an interesting culture comment. throughout history has had something. Well, yeah, absolutely. But, um, and so... You know some some of the other statistics actually that that I, I got from from you guys was um, overdoses have risen by three hundred and seventy percent since two thousand and ten, um, with a with a peak of uh, twenty one fifty five uh, deaths in two thousand sixteen. And I think that's really underreported because we know that a lot of death certificates are are put down as accidental or the the yeah. autopsies aren't done. So. It's astounding. It's more than um, car accidents, gun violence, and suicide combined. Well, so so the so the other statistic, you, wait, well, yeah, it's been what seventy seven thousand uh, in in how long? Just across the United States, right? right? More more people right. than we lost in Vietnam, right? And it's um, a it's about twice as bad in Massachusetts as it is the nation as a whole. So we have about twice the overdose rate as as the average of all the American states. Is that per capita or percentage? It's per capita, I believe. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. Um, so overdose, but no, 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 I'm sorry. That would be percentage. I percentage per, percentage per yeah. capita though, right? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And then, um, that overdoses have fallen in Massachusetts by, by about 4%. Um, I think a lot of the EDs are seeing that too. And um, that's, I think, is mostly attributed to, to Narcan. That's often attributed to Narcan. But the thing I've been thinking about is, um, you know, there's only, there's only a, a set pool of really high risk users. And we've been killing off, you know, at least 10% of them a year for, 
you know, four or five years now. And if it's not replenishing quick enough, um, we're going to see overdose rates decline simply because most of the people likely to overdose have already died. Do you understand yeah, what not, I'm saying? Well, not, not to make light of it, but it's like thinning out the herd, right? Exactly. So, so you're taking out, right. right, yeah. And so I don't want us to go around congratulating ourselves that we're, we're making progress when it's actually just that's a, a sad fact. That's, actually, that's actually an that. excellent point, Jared. Thank you. Yeah. That's really, that's really yeah, because I, I, I kind of question that myself, too. And I, and I, question, I question the numbers going down, too as to whether or not um, they're being misreported right. uh, or if, you know, you have, um, you have doctors and nurses that just don't want to deal with it and they're just simply putting down, well, you know, they came in for chest pains yeah. and, you know, we, we had to send them on their way because, uh, you know, we just, we didn't want to deal with another junkie in our hospital, right? Um, which, uh, you know, hopefully things like some of these public policies and, and things like that will uh, will start to address that. I th I think too is when you start um, throwing numbers like ninety one percent of, of people who are in active addiction want help, um, and you start explaining to the medical community that it is like shooting fish in a barrel, right. right? That if you can offer the correct services and if you can offer it in a compassionate and kind way, which is what you're really trained and Presumably why you got into this occupation in the first place is because you want to take care of people and, and you're a people person and you want healthy people around you and you have a percentage like 91% of those people want to get help, you would think you would be out beating the bushes looking for alcoholics and addicts, you know? So this so, actually reminds me of something that I, I'd like to bounce I off get, you. I get, I get a little hot about that. As, so. a, as, a, as an idea that I actually heard from a, uh, a family member who was at an event I was, I was facilitating the other day, and she had struggled with treatment for her, her daughter and her daughter being treated very... Her daughter has some complex medical needs and addiction and being treated very badly in a large public hospital. And her idea was to, to create a piece of legislation that would make doctors, as part of their continuing education credit, it's, um, take classes on addiction every year. What do you think about that? I think that would be an excellent idea. I do too. I mean, the the thing is, is that I have I have talked to people who have gone to medical school, and they get literally in the entire yeah. eight years about two hours worth exactly. of education on on addiction. And um, and to be and to be honest with you, um, you know, I've I've been, I've been I've been sober for a while. I've been I've been in recovery for over a decade now. Uh, and I go to a lot of um, talks on addiction and alcoholism that are run by the medical community, and my boss always makes fun of me, and she goes, well, don't you know enough about this already? I go, I'm not going to learn anything. I'm going to see what, I'm, going up, to I'm, I'm, going to see what I'm up against. Right. right? Uh, you're absolutely right. I think part, part, of, part of the – particularly with, with the issue that we have right now, right? I'm, I'm seeing an influx in alcoholism, in alcohol use. Uh, a lot of these programs were rolled out and put together to address the opioid crisis, right. which as, as it should be, but I would say 50% of the people that are referred to me um, have alcohol issues. Yeah. And that's, that's really high for section 35s for involuntary commitments to treatment as well. Um, especially if you're dealing with homeless people, it's, you know, nearly half alcohol or at least alcohol involved. Um, so that's, that problem's still there. Um, I wanted to, I think it was a segue, a good segue talking about beds and, and changes in math health to talk about the, the budget issues we're, we're concerned about yeah, absolutely. this year. Um, so the big question we get who's, when we talk who's, about whose budget. So we're part of a, a coalition called the Mass Coalition for Addiction Services, and we're in it with the Association for Behavioral Health, um, the parent group like Learn to Cope, um, actually some medical students and uh, others. And we go up to the state house every year and we ask for um, funding to improve addiction services through um, the Department of Public Health. Um, so we come up with priorities every year. They're informed by more members and by providers. And I think, we go I think you guys are looking at like forty-five million, aren't you? Yeah, we. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably shouldn't say this publicly, but unfortunately, the person who usually does that sheet was uh, was going through a medical problem when when it was done, and I kind of stuck some numbers on there, and somehow they carried through. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we, we're not likely to get all of that, but but it's a it's a starting point to talk about. 
Um, and the question we get a lot is why are there not, why are you not asking for more beds right here? And that's because of the situation I just explained with, with mass health where, where the beds are coming and the legislators know that. So they're not likely to put more in the state budget at that moment. That doesn't mean there aren't gaps to address. So a big one that matters to, to me and to, I think a lot of people in your realm is, um, access to, uh, recovery community centers. So absolutely. Um, the state, um, as of right now, has 10 of these that are funded um, through DPH. There's more that are funded through the federal government and through private agencies. Um, last year, we were successful in um, getting state legislators to fund at least five more. Um, the applications have just come in for that. And I can say that um, for each of those five spots, there are at least five communities applied. So there's a tremendous demand for these places. And these are places where people in early recovery can go um, have a safe, sober environment and get access to some supports like recovery coaching, but also just make those connections and have that that community and have that help to build their recovery capital and to, to maintain rather than go back to the community and the people where they were using, which is, uh, which is likely to cause relapse. So, so where I don't expect you to know all of them, but where, where are these recovery uh, centers currently located? So there, <laughs> this is really putting me on the spot. I should know all of them, but um, well, I told you. I, I told you. I don't expect you to know all. Of them. <laughs> so there's there's two in Boston, which is where I live. So it's Step Rocks in Roxbury and the Divine Recovery Center. Um, there's one in Fall River. There's one in Hyannis. There's one in um, Marlboro. There's one in Worcester. There's one in Holyoke, and I believe there's one in Greensboro, and I think one in Springfield. And I, you know. There's a big gap in the the North Shore area where really? we are right now, <laughs> um, which is part of the impetus for why why we've identified this as a as a goal. Um, it wasn't really the North Shore, but but folks from our meeting in Somerville said, "Hey, you know, our." our but I think along with Boston, North Shore has some of the highest absolutely. highest rates of, of overdose and overdose deaths also right. in the state. Right. So it's always kind of surprised us, and I'm certainly not directing this comment at you. It's always kind of surprised us here on the North Shore that there there hasn't been funding and and a lot of a lot of the requests for a recovery center on the North Shore have hasn't come our way, right? We have there are a couple um, organizations that are working on trying to trying to get one, and I think they've put the paperwork in. But you know, we we sit here and watch our, e our ERs fill up and Absolutely. people die and we put the request in for some of these. I mean, I don't know what the statistics are like and you might be able to tell me this, but I know, again, going back to uh, uh, Charlie Baker's uh, commission on, um, on uh, safe injection sites is uh, facilities like that and not just, not just, you know, not just shooting galleries or whatever you want to call them, um, but like recovery centers too, is that the the rate of, of overdose and death by overdose within a five to 10 mile radius of those places drops by almost 35%, wow. right? And yeah. there are no more needles on the ground. There are no more people shooting up in alleys. There are no more people dying on the streets, right? But it drops by 35%, right? Those are huge numbers, right? And Absolutely. I mean, as an aside, I think that and the 91% number are are staggering numbers to be able to hear and come back from Vancouver and go, no, we're not going to do that. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a little disappointed. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really tough in it. I'm sure Gary talked about the need for long-term education when we're yeah. doing this. Stuff. Yeah. Well, I've had this conversation with, with, with Gary many times. Um, you know, and, and these recovery centers are also about putting a face to recovery and breaking down some of these stigma. Cause you know, 10 years ago, if you tried to, to start a halfway house or a treatment center in somebody's neighborhood and almost anywhere in Massachusetts, we got not in my backyard. I don't want this. I don't want this here. We have um, that going on in Salem right now. A guy wants to start a detox up, at, up along the water. And um, they don't want it. And the neighbors are, you know, they're out of their minds. But um, for these recovery centers, at least the 
the local officials and, and the mayors and the, the councilmen have really gotten behind it and are supporting it. And state legislators are sending letters for their communities to get them. And, and they just want these places because they form a community around recovery. They help keep people safe. And not for nothing, they do a lot of outreach and public service and, and um, great things for the community as well. You heard John McGann, who's the the president of the Gavin Foundation on on Monday at our forum say that you get um, essentially a great bang for your buck right. when we're dealing with limited resources and you can create this facility for I think he said short money and get to hundreds of people a day um, you're doing well yeah so here's since we don't have them on the North Shore <laughs> <laughs> um, and I and I did want to ask you this question anyway but um, these are these are brick and mortar. Right, they're they're pretty much like they're in a space, and what does that space look like? So, so, I, I, so absolutely. So, so what I'm doing is I'm asking you a really stupid question. I'm asking you to tell me what a recovery center is. Absolutely, and I actually missed one. There is one in Lawrence, but um, they take that's not on the North Shore. Yeah, it's not on the North Shore, but I, <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to forget because um, actually, I don't think there are any on the North Shore. No, there aren't. No, no. <laughs> but I didn't want to forget our, our friends up there. Um, so I've been in them, they've looked like different things. So the one in South Boston, the Divine Recovery Center, it's a it's basically a big old house that was at one point owned by the church. And so these places are are independent peer-run facilities, but they're overseen by established treatment providers. So like the Gavin Foundation or Gandhara or Spectrum. And in that case, it's like a house the the one in Lawrence, it's more of a, a storefront, but the space is divided up. There's obviously a space for meetings. There's a larger space for presentations and 12-step type stuff. There's a pool table. There's a chill-out area with, with a TV. Um, there's there's offices where people can meet one-on-one -on -one with uh, with staff and peer supporters. And they they take different forms, and there, there are different models, too. Um, we've heard of... Uh, a model that's more based off a cafe setting that actually gener generates some revenue by having no you know, food and drink there too. That's that's for people in recovery. And we heard from the Phoenix on on Monday, which is kind of a, a different um, concept of a recovery center that's around having a gym for people in recovery and having some organized sports come out of there. So um, my understanding is that the state at this point is also open to hear about different models and different ways to conceive of what a peer recovery center can be. So are these, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Are these, are these 24 seven or are they business hours or, um, do they also have no one's, no one lives there, right? Right. Uh, so they're longer than business hours. I, uh, you know, I don't want to. Well, like rest, restaurant hours. How's that? Yeah. If restaurant, you, restaurant hours. And, Restaurants uh, are usually, yeah. Usually, <laughs> Usually opened on the weekends, and then they'll they'll do special stuff for holidays, and they they host different types of all recovery meetings uh, throughout the day, and they'll also have uh, days of the week when there's like a person to come to help people build resumes or um, a person to come do a education around computers. They'll have some computers and a printer available to to help people get on their on their feet and apply for jobs. Okay, so I mean it's ba it's basically support for people in recovery. And then there's the peer support also, right? You have right. A kind of a little community, right? You can come hang out if you're, if you're afraid to be by yourself and things like that. It cuts down on, on being isolated. And what, what about um, any kind of community, community action coming out of, of any of those, those, um, those centers? Is there any outreach from the centers or uh, any, any kind of, um, you know, we, we always say it, it's attraction, not promotion. But right. is there any kind of promotion on uh, of these of these recovery centers? And 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 also, what about the pushback from the communities? Is is are you finding are you finding that that any of the communities are pushing back on some of these centers? And have there been any problems with with, with that? I've only heard good to answer the latter part of that. I've only heard good stuff, and the the communities, even if they were reluctant to to have them there to begin with, they they turn around relatively quickly because yeah. this is not this is not a place that's attracting people that are actively using drugs or committing crimes. This is a center for the recovery community. Um, I would say that um, you know they they're run through what's called a peer participatory 
process. So the members of the organization really contribute in deciding how things like outreach are done. Um, different centers do different things. There's out, there's one out in Western Mass that actually has a, a thrift shop in the basement. And by participating in different recovery activities, you can get vouchers to go get th- stuff for yourself at the, the thrift shop. So there's, oh, there's unique cool. stuff going on. They'll have, um, they'll have big, the one in South Boston has excellent large recovery parties and a 4th of July thing. And every, they all do a, a recovery month event of some kind to get out there. And then the, there's the community service stuff that goes on. So, um, a lot of them will go do things like deliver meals to vets and, uh, help out with, um, you know, neighborhood cleanup and stuff like that. So, so there is, there is quite a bit of community involvement then on, on the part of a lot of these community centers, right? Is some good, some goodwill back to the community and stuff like that. I mean, what, what's interesting is, is I, I ask you a question like that. And then of course my, because I'm, I'm highly skeptical is that, you know, you, I've only heard good things is what you said. And I go, well, yeah, of course he's saying that he's got a microphone in front of him, <laughs> but, but I, but I actually, I actually genuinely believe you that, um, that, and, and, and it really wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I've said this, I've said this a lot and I've said this in, in, in previous shows, right. Is, um, I never thought that I was going to be working in this field. Um, neither this, did I, this, this was, this was not my choice. Um, but the people with whom I work, um, the people who need our help the most, I find to be some of the kindest, most compassionate, funniest people I'd ever want to come across. And the only thing that makes my life difficult doing this job is the quote unquote normal people that I have to deal with. You know? no, I, I have to tell you, Richard, and, and I don't say this much anymore, but you reminded me when I was still kind of caught up in the system, I'd say that I, I found the people in jail a lot nicer than most of the people at MIT. So, yeah. um, I mean, that, that's what it is. Most people are caught up in, in their every day. And I think that being in recovery and, and going through that struggle, there's a certain amount of perspective and a certain amount of humility that the general population just doesn't get. Well, the thing is, is I think there's, there is, um, we're, we're all uh, suffering in one way or another. Right, whether you're in in active addiction in recovery or not, right? This, I mean, that's the first noble truth of Buddhism is that life is suffering, right? So it's how people are dealing with that, and um, I, I look at it this way, right? Is I, f- I find more compassion in in a in just having a small group once a week with people who are either a- actively using and trying to recover people who are in recovery, people who have been recovered for, you know, two or three years, six months or a year, because they at least, it's not that they, they know what's wrong with them. They at least have admitted that there's something wrong with them. Right. Right. The rest of the people that drive me nuts have no idea that there's actually something wrong with them. (laughs) And, and there's something wrong with everyone. Right. We all, we all have something wrong with us. Um, regardless of what that is, there, there are character defects in all of us. There are, there are huge issues that we drag around like, like, a um, uh, an anvil, uh, for decades and never get that weight off your back. Um, and people deal and people, and people in recovery tend to address those issues as if their life depended on it because it does. Because it does. And just the amount of, you said, compassion, the ability to identify with one another when you've all admitted you have the same problem is absolutely phenomenal. And that's that's what really struck me going into treatment. And I that's what made me feel like the, you know, this is my tribe. I found my yeah. people. Yeah, exactly. And I can be I can be closer to this kid that that grew up in, in Dorchester with nothing and started to use with his mom when he was a teenager than I could have been with half the grad students at MIT just because we have that struggle in that identification in common. I have friends today that purely on the way that they look and act, I would never have spoken to had I not been in recovery. Neck tattoos? For example. <laughs> you know? I mean, for example. Right? It doesn't really matter. It's like I, I my first sponsor was 75 years old. He had 35 years of sobriety. He's, he had Nazi tattoos. He re- still rode Harleys. He was a prospect for the Hells Angels, right? Um, had shot two guys in Lynn wow. when he got sober. And um, was, um, you know, he and I d- definitely had different 
political and philosophical views, right? But we had a lot, we had a similarity. Yeah, we had a similarity in that we had we had the same issues going on between our ears, and um, and we learned to communicate, right? And through that, I've I've learned to communicate with a lot of different people from a lot of a lot of different varieties, and um, and it makes it really interesting, and and the people that I that I actually enjoy, and get the most out of are really the people who are in in recovery or even not in recovery but are are when you can actually sit down and talk to someone who's actively using and and understand what is happening and and they know that you understand what's happening there's a connection there that um that to to me is is why we're here absolutely right i had a i had a friend once say we were having this you know big conversation one day and it was like it all got to like you know why are we here why are we here and he just looked at me he goes richard we're here for each other and I, that stuck with me more than probably any conversation i've had in in the last 12 years just simply because of the way he said it and and he meant it right Absolutely, and we need we need to listen to those people more in our in our public policy. Um, I I went to a meeting of the the Boston Drug Users Union a couple months ago, and I, I'd recommend going down there if if you ever get a chance. And it's like we're here banging our heads against the wall. How do we prevent overdoses? What can we do for these people? Oh, this is so hard. And nobody's gone and asked them. You know, <laughs> let's go sit down with them and figure out how they're preventing overdose deaths and what they need to stay safe. Right. And unfortunately, um, and I'll give them credit in the, the harm reduction commission that, that you that you spoke about several times during the show. They started to listen to those voices and they came out with some good recommendations. That's good. Yeah, because yeah. I'm actually going to the Recovery Coach Commission on Monday. Um, they're having another another session. Um, that's nice. uh, Monday. What, what date would that be? That would be um, the. 17th or the 18th something like that it's yeah i believe it's the 18th and then the day after is uh the 19th which is a there's a meeting of the the medication assisted treatment commission which i'm actually sitting on um and that's at the dph building which is 100 washington street on the second floor and uh we're examining issues like access to medication assisted treatment barriers and we're going to be making recommendations to the the state legislature much in the way the recovery coaching commission is yeah so either way regardless if this if this show drops um even by monday it'll be too late to go to any of those so (laughs) i didn't even think about that (laughs) because we're we're friday already so we're actually what we we should maybe get back together and talk about what happened at those commissions um when when they happen so listen, we, um, believe it or not, have gone well over an hour. Um, I do want to ask you one last question. And that last question is the same question I asked just about everyone, which is, um, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wish I had? You know, I didn't, I didn't fill in all the gaps on our, our policy this year, but I feel good about what we talked about. And I hope that your listeners um, appreciate it. I tell people to, uh, to look at the documents we put up there and just sign up as a member of more if you want to get involved in this stuff. Um, I'm always available. Um, my email address is J-A-R-E-D at our website, which is M-O-A-R-Recovery.org. Um, shoot me an email. I'd love to have a conversation. And uh, I just want to thank you, Richard, for, for putting this together. We were talking beforehand, and I, I think it's about time somebody sat down to do this, and I'm glad you are. Well, I think information is important. So, um, again, uh, we've been talking, or I've been talking to, and you've been listening to uh, Jared Owen, and he is the Director of Public Policy and Communications at uh, MORE, which is a Massachusetts Organization for Addiction Recovery. I'd like to thank him for coming out here, um, and uh, I would love to have you back on the show for, for another conversation. So again, uh, thank you, uh, Jared.